Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is Daily Drop number 367. Today, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals heard arguments from Courtney Wilde's attorneys and the United States government. And during that time, the point was made by Courtney Wilde's attorney, Paul Cassell, that the victim's rights agreement certainly wasn't abided by. And it seemed like the government was making the point that, well, we agree that we treated these girls absolutely terribly. Not only do we agree that we treated them terribly, we also want to apologize for it to, for it, the inferral that these girls were prostitutes because that's not the case. So for those of you who are pining about, oh, these girls were just prostitutes, well, put that in your pipe and smoke it because these girls were not prostitutes. They were being trafficked by this dude. And that whole entire prostitution argument was cooked up by Mr. I Kept My Underpants on Dershowitz, Lefkowitz, Star, and the rest of Jeffrey Epstein's legal team the first time around. So the government is not saying that they weren't at fault here. They're not saying that they didn't step out of line. What they're saying is, well, it's just a technicality, though. And even though we know that we stepped out of line, it's a bad precedent for us to set if, you know, we don't try and cover our ass here. That's pretty much what it seems like, and that's pretty much what I got out of the um, the hearing this morning while I was tuning in. And there were a couple of the judges who I thought were pretty ridiculous, and, and one of them was uh, Brasher, the other one was Pryor, and the other judge, the third judge's name was Wilson, I believe. And they were, uh, they didn't seem receptive at all, pretty much, to Courtney Wilde's uh, arguments. And Judge LaGoya, she didn't seem too receptive either, but I couldn't really get a feel for her. As for the other judges, well, you had the, uh, the, the one guy who's 91, he couldn't even figure out how to unmute his computer, never mind sitting for a case like this, but that's a different conversation, I guess. And uh, Frank Hull was pretty staunch in her support, once again, of Courtney Wilde and the survivors. And as far as the rest of those judges, I couldn't really get a feel one way or the other. And I kind of had the same feeling after the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and their hearing when it came to the deposition. It kind of seemed like they were... Um, leaning towards keeping the document sealed at some points, and then some of them seemed like they wanted them unsealed, and then obviously at the end of the day they ended up being unsealed. So, like I said earlier, I'm certainly no, uh, you know, specialist when it comes to this stuff or, or an expert. I don't sit around watching court cases all the time and watching how they progress. This is my first time doing this, my first time digging into something like this. But I will say this, that say that they decide that due to the technicality, they keep the prosecution agreement in place. Well, that just means that for those specific crimes that were committed in Florida, allegedly, that they're protected from those crimes. That does not mean that the government can't set up a RICO case like they're doing right now with Maxwell, we would hope, or a case like they're doing with Maxwell in New York, because we know these crimes were committed in multiple states, and they could go about it that way as well. Getting rid of the NPA would just streamline everything and make it so much quicker as as opposed to dragging it out and making it become another long, protracted legal fight, because that's definitely what's getting set up. And if the NPA is withheld by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, then the next step, I would guess, is to petition the Supreme Court to hear the case. 
and move, try and move forward that way. But at the same time, you would hope that the criminal portion of this investigation that's already ongoing would expand their investigation that is already ongoing at the SDNY, and it would include these co-conspirators. Because from the, the conversation that was had by the prosecutor today, nobody is disputing that this was a criminal conspiracy being engaged in by these people around Jeffrey Epstein and, of course, Jeffrey Epstein himself. I don't think that's even in dispute anymore. So... The, the question becomes, when is the next step going to be kicked in? When are some of these unsealed indictments going to be made public? And when are some of these co-conspirators going to be arrested? Because remember, like I just said, there is sufficient circumstantial evidence enough for probable cause that these people were involved with the whole entire criminal enterprise, not just what occurred in Florida. So the NPA would only protect them from what Jeffrey Epstein was already tried for down there in Florida, right? It doesn't protect them from new charges. So while the NPA will go a long way to streamline all of this, even if the 11th Circuit Court decides to show their, uh, you know, their poor judgment and keep it active and rule with the government over Courtney, that it this that that isn't the end of it, right? There is still a path for prosecutions here. But I think that it goes a long way to get rid of the non-prosecution agreement. It will go a long way to restore some faith, even just if it's a little bit that some of these rights can be wronged. None of this should be written in stone. If there was a mistake by the government, then it needs to be addressed and it needs to be fixed and the public should be made aware of it. It shouldn't be this this nonsensical BS we see here, this dance around the fire. This is the main reason I started investigating this case in the first place, because of the government misconduct. I had no idea the vastness of all of it, obviously, but the government misconduct angle and the way that the Department of Just Us conducted themselves was one of the major factors that got me interested in this case in the first place. So to see it all unfold the way it's unfolding and to see some of these judges, I, it's just it just proves, at least to me, that the whole entire system, for the most part, is rotted from the inside out. And to be honest with you, I don't have any answers on how to fix that, folks. I really don't. I, You know, I'm just as perplexed as everybody else. I don't have the answers. I won't make pretend I do. But I think it goes a long way to hold people accountable even if they're people in positions of power in the government, even if they're judges. It shouldn't matter. If you were in the wrong, then you should be sanctioned or fired or whatever it may be, and redress should be had for those who were wronged and the American people as a whole. Tonight, our article is from Politico.com. The headline, Department of Justice. Prosecutor erred by promising to confer with Jeffrey Epstein survivors. This article was authored by Josh Gerstein. The rank and file prosecutor, her name is Steinberg, handling the federal criminal and excuse me. The rank and file prosecutor handing in the federal criminal investigation more than a decade ago, that would be Villafana into sex trafficking by financier, pedophile, Jeffrey Epstein, erred by telling survivors they had legal rights to weigh in on the outcome of the inquiry, a Justice Department attorney told a federal court Thursday. So, basically what they want us to believe is it's all Villafana's fault, right? Now, I'm certainly not a champion of Villafana, as you all know, but I do think she is a lot less scummy than the rest of these guys, and it's certainly not her fault. 
according to the amicus brief that was filed by the people who wrote the law, Villafana interpreted it correctly and the prosecutors and the federal government did not. Now, again, I'm not a lawyer, but that's the way I see it. So I think it's funny that they would come out and they'd try and lambaste her and say that she uh, she made the mistake in telling the survivors that they'd confer. So, again, it's like the government, just like the so-called elite, never wants to take responsibility when they're wrong. In video arguments to the full to the full bench of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, Department of Justice attorney Jill Steinberg said that prosecutor Marie Villafana was trying to be compassionate towards the survivors, but the consultation she guaranteed them wasn't actually required by law. And, well, we all know that federal officers and cops are notorious for lying to you anyway. So why would we expect any different here? Although with the Victims' Rights Act, you would think that these gals or anyone who is abused would be afforded more rights than normal when it comes to this sort of thing. It's just like if there's a hate crime, right? There are stiffer penalties and there must be redress for something like this. You know, people want to talk about precedent. How would it affect further, uh, you know, future rulings and shit to get rid of this uh, NPA? And I'd counter with, how would it affect the future in general if this NPA is left to stand? What sort of precedent does that set? It is such a stain and a black eye on the whole entire Department of Justice, not just in Florida. Not just Acosta, but the whole entire Department of Justice and the federal government. This should not be allowed to stand. Prosecutors ultimately held back on notifying survivors after Epstein's high-powered defense team vigorously objected. See, and that's the thing as well. If they were just holding back because they didn't see it fit into the framework of the law, then they'd have a legitimate excuse probably, right? Uh, An argument where you might roll your eyes, but you're like, all right, at least it's not a technicality. At least these guys have some sort of defensible position. But this nonsense about the um, high-powered defense team and how they vigorously objected, this, that's, that's just a dog whistle for them strong-arming the prosecutors. How do a team of lawyers strong-arm United States federal prosecutors into giving Jeffrey Epstein this sort of deal? How is that even possible? That's a question that needs to be answered still. There is no legitimate answer for that question, in my opinion. They should never, I don't care how high profile the lawyers are, they should never be able to pressure and strong arm federal prosecutors who have the full, the full weight of the United States government behind them. What is it, like a 97% success rate for the federal government in federal court when it goes to trial? So I don't know why these guys would be getting strong-armed unless, of course, well, someone like Mukasey or his chief deputy gave that order. Then, of course, well, yeah, I could see it then. But just to be strong-armed, I I just I don't I don't see that happening. I'm sorry. She wanted to give as broad protection to the survivors as possible. And, unfortunately, in doing so, I think people might have felt misled, Steinberg told the appeals court. In terms of what the requirements are of the Crime Victims' Rights Act, that never changed. It's sort of a learning lesson for people in my position to be careful about what it is, what we say, and distinguish between policy and what we want to do as good human beings. We can maybe have it turned against us. Oh yeah, the the federal government. Yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the, the 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 idea. The federal government's the victim here, huh? The federal government's been victimized by the law. Huh. Give me an absolute break. And no, it's not. This ain't some learning, uh, uh, some teachable moment. Okay, you're not learning on the fly here. Learning on the job here. I'm talking about people's lives both ways. 
Those accused and those doing the accusing. So you sons of bitches better get your act together. You better get your ducks in a row. Because the fact that this has been allowed to stand for this long is beyond me. Victim Courtney Wilde sued the federal government in 2008 in a bid to dissolve the complex, aggressively negotiated deal that resulted in Epstein pleading guilty to two prostitution-related felonies in state court in exchange for a guarantee of no federal prosecution over his alleged procurement of dozens of underage girls for sex acts. Wild suit contended that the federal non-prosecution agreement was approved without the conferral required by the 2004 Victims' Rights Statute. Look, he is not wrong. That's what this law was put onto the books for. And the lawmakers finally put a law on the books that we can all get down with, a law that actually makes some sense. And these assholes are still finding loopholes, still finding technicalities, even when those very same people, the ones who wrote the law, okay, come out, file an amicus brief, and say that the interpretation by the federal government is wrong. How does any of that jive? How does any of that make sense? For years, little attention was paid to her suit and the grievance of some survivors over the treatment of the wealthy and well-connected Epstein, who served 13 months in county jail and was allowed to visit his office on most days. However, public outrage intensified last year after a federal judge in West Palm Beach ruled that prosecutors violated the victim's rights law in their handling of Epstein and that they deliberately misled survivors about the status of negotiations with his tenacious attorneys. And if he didn't die, this this NPA would have been overturned. And that's another thing that you should keep in mind. All right? If he was still alive... This would have this would have been overturned already. So while again, I am more than willing to believe that he committed suicide if the if the evidence is presented, there sure are a lot of reasons that the alternative could be true as well. Among those skewered by the ruling was Alex Acosta, who served as the chief federal prosecutor in South Florida at the time the deal was cut and was serving as President Donald Trump's labor secretary. Acosta weathered that storm but resigned in July 2019 after federal prosecutors in New York indicted Epstein on sex trafficking charges dating back to the 2000s. And again... While I completely agree that Acosta's a scumbag, the buck shouldn't have stopped there. The tenaciousness should have continued. Julie Brown and the Miami Herald should have been kicking in Mukasey's door as well. Nobody like Acosta makes these decisions in a vacuum on their own of their own will. All right? They might have the idea and they might throw it up the ladder the chain of command and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. But the final decision decision isn't being made by Acosta. Epstein was denied bail in that case and died while housed at a federal jail in Manhattan. Officials pronounced the death a suicide. One of Epstein's longtime companions, co-conspirator, all-around scuzzbag, fellow child abuser, and bipedal serpent, Ghislaine Maxwell, was arrested in July of this year on charges that she aided Epstein's abuse. She is also being held without bail. In April, a three-judge panel of the 11th Circuit ruled 2-1 to one that survivors could not enforce their rights where no federal prosecution has been filed. So, again, it's the technicality of it, right? Oh, there's no federal prosecution that's been filed here. Well, yeah, it was about to be filed, but the state intervened for this specific purpose, I would guess, to circumvent this whole entire process. Because that's what they have done the whole entire time. And they've been aided and abetted by scuzzbags in the court. However... 
Lawyers for Wilde protested that ruling, and the court later agreed to rehear her case and bonk. Steinberg, who is based in the Atlanta U.S. Attorney's Office, was brought in after the federal judge's ruling that Acosta's office broke the law in its handling of the Epstein inquiry. So the, a federal judge has already ruled that they broke the law in the way they handled this. All right. So now we're arguing over technicalities. It's already been established that they broke the law. But, you know, again, a lot of these judges are fickle, shall we say. Steinberg never mentioned Villafana by name during the arguments Tuesday. After handling sex abuse and trafficking cases in Florida for over a decade, Villafana quit her job last year and joined another federal agency. The judges who were at arguments for about 70 minutes on Thursday did not explicitly declare their positions on the appeal, but several seemed to either disagree with Wilde's lawyers, reading of the law, or harbor fears about the potential fallout of giving survivors an enforceable right to consult with prosecutors when a deal is arrived at the results at that results in a suspect that a suspected not being prosecuted. So it's all about precedent, precedent, right? They're worried about what this could foretell in the future and what bearing this will have on cases in the future. And like I said earlier, I contend that I'm worried about the now. What, what kind of impact is this going to have now? And what kind of impact is this going to have on other cases like this moving forward? It's time to set the, to set the standard here, folks. Judge Charles Wilson noted that such deals are often cut when someone agrees to testify against others or to provide sensitive information, often at the risk of considerable danger to themselves. Mr. Epstein was a pretty bad guy, but you're asking the court to apply precedent in future cases that may not be as bad as this one, Wilson told Paul Cassell, a law professor and retired federal judge representing Wilde. Look... I get it, right? Precedent is important. It's something that has to be thought about. But what about the here and now? What about the egregious treatment that Courtney Wilde and these other survivors have received at the hands of the federal government, at the hands of people that, at the end of the day, we employ as citizens? It doesn't sit well with me. And it's a shame that these judges rule their courtrooms like mini fiefdoms. Cassell said the Crime Victims' Rights Act doesn't guarantee a consultation in all circumstances, but only where it would be reasonable and, he said, it wouldn't be reasonable in that kind of scenario. But other judges raised questions about how workable that distinction would be and whether district court judges were prepared to take on litigation where private parties are examining the agreements reached with fearful government witnesses. Oh, that, I think that's a bit of fear-mongering. I think that is a bit of fear-mongering on the part of the court. I think that there shouldn't be just one blanketed way things are uh, gone about. I think that each circumstance is unique and the information of each circumstance should play into how it's addressed. Cassell said that concern was fairly remote, given that Wilde's case was the only one of its kind since the CVRA has been on the books. This is once in a 16 years situation, he said. And he's not wrong about that, right? This, it's not like these kinds of cases are popping up every day and this is going to be a huge burden and it's going to set terrible precedent, right? Because that's not the case in my opinion. But again, I'm not a lawyer and I, I don't know the ins and the outs of these laws the way that these people do. So I'm just speaking as someone sitting on the sidelines, right? My opinion and the way I am interpreting what's going on. Cassell also opened his arguments Thursday by pointing to an amicus brief filed by Senator Dianne Feinstein and former Senators John Kyle and Orrin Hatch, affirming that the 2004 law was intended to apply even before a case went to court. So, 
These are the, again, these are the people that wrote the laws, but these judges feel like it's their job to interpret them and I don't know, control things from the bench because you would think that the people who actually the judges job is to enforce the law. Right? It's their job to make sure that they're following the constitution and the guidelines of the court. And if these people who wrote this law are saying that it was indeed intended to be used even before a case went to court, then I think that that should have some sway, right? Especially considering this isn't some kind of um, common law that we run into all the time. This is a once in a 16 year span, as Mr. Cassell said. As the judges drilled down on fine points in the law, Cassell cautioned them against a hyper-technical reading. This act was designed to be interpreted by crime victims, most of whom would lack legal counsel, he said. Sterling said the door was open to survivors pursuing a complaint at the Justice Department if they felt snubbed by prosecutors, but that survivors don't have a right to get relief from a court in cases that don't result in prosecution. And that's BS by Mr. Sterling, okay? That wasn't a very sterling opinion, sir. Not a very hot take. What is the whole point of having a court system set up if it's not going to protect people from the government and from the most powerful amongst us? So is there no redress? Is that what you want to tell? 200, 300 million plus people? That they have no redress and that the government and the Department of Justice can't even protect our children from these sorts of monsters, all based on a technicality. That's the route you want to go after what you have just seen in the streets of America and around the world for the last six months. It's a bold move, Cotton. But Cassell said that wouldn't do much for Wild. That's a meaningless remedy because all of the architects of this non-prosecution agreement have left government employment, he said. And that's for sure. What are they supposed to do? What, are they going to get a uh, uh, letter dressing them down? Oh, you are bad. You made bad decisions. That's what we already got from the garbage-ass internal Department of Justice investigation that they so-called kicked into gear. Judge Frank Hull, who was the dissenter from the April Appeals Court, appeared to be the most vigorous defender of Wilde's position on Thursday. The Appeals Court could avoid squaring up to the key question in the case by resolving it on, oh, what do you know, technical grounds, what do you, technical grounds. It's always technical grounds and loopholes and garbage like that. So sick of it. Wilde has now conferred with prosecutors in New York about the case there, so Wilson suggested Thursday that the dispute before them might be moot. Of course he did. They have better things to do, don't you know? They want to go play golf or whatever it is these sort of people do. They want to go throw some uh, some drug to, uh, some people that were in possession of drugs in, in, into prison for 175 years. Forget about sex traffickers or their criminal co-conspirators. Forget about all of that. We got other things to do. We got to go enact the Patriot Act and we have to go make sure we kick in doors and prosecute the war on drugs and all the other stupid bullshit they gaslight us with while ignoring all of the most important shit going on around us. But Cassell insisted it was not because the non-prosecution agreement still appears to rule out prosecuting several of F. Epstein's associates on some charges stemming from conduct in South Florida. Miss Wilde never had a chance to describe what those co-conspirators had done to her, he said. And that's the, the big problem for me right there. The fact that this grand jury in Florida only heard from one accuser and the lengths that they went to destroy her credibility and the credibility of these other girls by calling them prostitutes and shit, it is just unseemly that Courtney Wilde has never been given the chance to confront her, her uh, the, those that she accuses in a court of law. That's not how this is supposed to work. 
This system is completely broken in my opinion. And again, I don't have all the answers on how to fix it, but we can't stay the course, right? How long are you going to yell, stay the course, stay the course? As an island and reef comes into view. Me, I think that it's time to turn the ship, folks. I think it's time for a new path. I think it's time we try something different. And I think that these people, like Jeffrey Epstein, his associates, a lot of these lawyers have been living in a separate reality from actual reality for far too long. And I think that when they crash down from their high horse, it's going to be rather painful for them. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that go with this episode can be found in the description box. All right, everybody, I'll be back tomorrow morning and we will see what in the hell is going on with all of these degenerates on the stage of Jeffrey Epstein's disgusting play. I hope you all have a great night.